don't even know how you still got hair on your head if you're talking about that's your day to day worrying and stressing out the whole day. You know what I mean? When but, you do what you love, it doesn't feel like a job. And that's the importance. I feel like if you're going to be in nursing, it has to be something that you love to do because it shows. It shows. Um, and, or any practitioner. Yeah. Um, when they don't, like when their heart is not in what they're doing, it shows in their care. Completely shows in their yeah. care. Yeah. This is that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, young Pira Overdilla. Behind the mic like the will of a vehicular killer. The three of What's up, everybody? You are now tuned into another episode of The Chop Up. I am Yao Asante, and I'm glad to have everybody who's able to watch. In the midst of this pandemic, you know, there's a, a lot of support being given to essential workers. You log into Instagram, your Facebooks, um, any type of social media platform, you see people giving cupcakes, food to the nurses, doctors, firefighters, policemen, um, you know, just anybody who's actually giving back to the community. So I thought it would be a really cool idea to have two essentially black employees talk about their experiences, how they got to where they are right now, and kind of just learn a little bit of what it is to be essentially black in the workforce. So without further ado, I would like to introduce two well-renowned registered nurses. Um, one nurse is actually known for uh, being in FETs and giving out medication the other uh, nurse is known for uh, giving daggering classes and uh, dance hall moves in um, you know, patient waiting rooms. It's very, very, very intriguing how they mix the two worlds. Trinidad and Jamaica, I think we got a good one. Alicia and Brittany, thank you for joining the chop up. <laughs> I don't think you guys like the introduction. That, that, you know, I, I've worked and I've rehearsed that. I say, you know what, I got I to make sure that they, they get represented right, you know what I mean? But, it, it don't seem like it hit a chord, you know? So Canadian, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that so part. I guess my first question to both of y'all, how, how are you guys mentally coping with the pandemic that we've all been impacted with? Okay, I see one glass up in the air. All right. Now, another disclosure, Clico does not um, approve underage drinking. We are not a, a program that, uh, you know, we're not under age. Thank God we're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, I mean, Alicia, I mean, you know, uh, I know, I know you both work in hospitals in New York City. Um, outside of the workplace, how are you coping with um this pandemic and quarantining and social distancing and everything of that nature? I know everybody's lifestyle kind of went to a pause. So, what has it been like for you, um, being in a workplace that you're you're surrounded by so many people and now you come home? I don't know what your plans are, but you know, you kind of just abiding by the strict guidelines. Um, so for me personally, I think that it's great that we're working because it gives us a sense of normalcy. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of people are stuck at home and they're going crazy. For us, um, we're still going to work three times a week. We do have to quarantine when we're home. So we're not like out doing things. There's really nothing to do. Um, but for me mentally, like I just take my long five mile walks when I can. A lot of cooking, a lot of staying in touch with like my other friends who are healthcare workers. So we share stories. Um, that's pretty. A lot of wine. A lot of wine. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. wine. Binge, binge watching shows that I wasn't able to do before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, boring stuff, pretty much. <laughs> I, you know what? Personally, I I kind of like this downtime. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, I think you do get a lot of time to kind of just catch up and kind of take a breather. But um, I don't know if that's the same case for somebody from the Trinidadian world. You know, Trinidadians, they love to be in the uh, in the social scene. So yeah. I, I would love to hear how uh, Brady's been coping. You know? This social scene. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I won't lie. As far as being home, I mean, I have a daughter. So when things were at its peak, yeah. um, she had went away and was staying with her dad. I mean, I live in a basement apartment, so I've kind of been down here. As far as staying connected, I think that's the, the biggest part that's kind of kept me um, level-headed. Um, talking to Alicia, like she said, talking to other healthcare professionals that get it, yeah. um, where you don't have to explain the whole healthcare arena. You already kind of get the sense of how things are. Working in the hospital has been very important. Staying in touch with family, mm -hmm. even though you're not able to see them, whether it's FaceTime or Zoom meeting with college friends, just staying connected yeah. uh, 
as humans, we we need the interaction. So I think just having that piece has, is what got me through, um, you know, some of the difficult parts of this pandemic. What made both of you become nurses? Like, I would like to hear what was your background academically? I don't know if you two are part of some type of sorority or anything like that or any type of group. Um, I was talking, I think, in one episode where, you know, culturally, I know when I was growing up, my parents always wanted me to be a doctor. I don't know why that's the African thing to do, but all Africans want their kids to be doctors to go back and save the village. So I don't know. I mean, you could tell the viewers a little bit of your cultural background and then you could tie in your academic experience. Because for me, I mean, I went to school for like five years for my undergrad, three of those years I was like in nursing. I mean, I went to high school for nursing, then I went to college for nursing. And it, it just wasn't me. Yeah, I, you know, I was being forced, man. I was being forced. Like, if I don't do this, I can't save the village. I can't. You know what I mean? So let me know what your cultural background and then also tying in your academic experience that led you to becoming a registered nurse today. That was not my aspiration at all. Um, I'm Jamaican. Boop, boop. And, yeah. Boop, boop, boop. Oh. <laughs> so exactly. both my grandmother were nurses. Um, like my mom is a registered dietitian. Like a lot of my family are in healthcare. Okay. I had no um, interest in healthcare at all. I have uh, my undergrad is in business marketing and international business. So mm-hmm. like I had no plans on becoming a nurse. Um, when the market crashed, um, I lost my job. Like I got laid off and my mom was like, you should be a nurse. You're so kind. You're so this, you're so that. And I was like, absolutely not. Like I'm not doing that. A couple of like things happened. My mom got sick. Uh, a cut. Co- my cousin had a baby. I was in the room. I thought it was very intriguing, and I was like, you know what? Let me start taking prereqs. So I was working, and I started taking prerequisites. I had finished all the prerequisites, and I was like, I'm just gonna apply to nursing school. I got in, and that was kind of like my journey, and I enjoyed it. I loved it. I met Brittany, um, and yeah, that's kind of how that's kind of how like my career path. You know, grew up in a Trini Grenadian household. Um, let's see. I have my grandmother was a CNA all her life. Mm-hmm. Um, never more than that. I have an aunt who's a nurse anesthetist. Um, but as far as we have more people in the business aspect of things, mm-hmm. um, as not really so much healthcare outside the two that I just mentioned, but. Since I was young, I always wanted to be a doctor. That was always the plan. It's going to be a doctor. If you ask anybody in high school who still knows me now, they'll be like, oh, Dr. Harvey. And then I went to school. I went to Stony Brook for undergrad and had a, I got sick my freshman year and I had a visiting nurse. The visiting nurse became like family. Mm-hmm. And um, throughout that whole process, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, nurses are really like, so such an integral part of the healing process um physically emotionally mentally and i was like i'm a people person i already knew i wanted to be in the medical field so i kind of just took the detour um into nursing and once i got into it i was like this is where i'm supposed to be um so i love it and we're here touching and healing and melanated and So, like, all right, we're going to get into the, the meat and potatoes of this, right? Because obviously we're in a very weird place in this world. So you got the cultural background, the experience that led you to becoming a nurse today. Um, I want to tie in a little bit of the things that I've been seeing in the media and things that's been reported by various, I don't know, news outlets, right? So I, I think I remember talking to Alicia at one point, and I, and I thought initially with this whole corona stuff that if you were... African American, you are safe, right? <laughs> Obviously, that's become like a false claim because it's, I think we're like the majority of people who actually um, um, are victims of this uh, virus or whatever the case is. So, with that being said, you know, I've been hearing so many different things about, you know, um, hospitals overflowing, uh, nursing homes overflowing, only the old people are catching it or anything like that. So, do you see any other? Uh, disproportions in what's being reported in the patients that you actually see on a day-to-day basis? Hmm. I would say from what I've seen, um, 
I work on a critical care floor. It's like ICU step down. And during COVID times, we just made it into an extension of the ICU. Mm -hmm. And from what I'm seeing, it changed from the beginning of COVID uh, towards the peak and coming down from the peak. I think we know a little bit more now than we did in the beginning. And like you said, at first it was, it's older people, it's 65 and up. And that quickly changed um, 39 year olds, 40 year olds. I will say that I've seen a lot of um, black and Latino groups more so sick um, than white counterparts. But I can say that it has not, um, as, as far as age is concerned, Corona has not discriminated. I've seen young, I've seen old, I've seen in the middle. But Black and um, Latino and overweight has seemed to be a common vein in the patients that I've been seeing, um, especially the ones that have like succumbed to the illness and yeah. have passed away is definitely obesity, um, African-American, and uh, Latino groups for me. So for me, the same thing. Like initially they were like, oh, um, you know, everyone was saying black people can't get it or whatever. My hospital is in a different location. Um, it's in Manhattan. It's in a very affluent neighborhood. Mm-hmm. I was seeing, um, I was seeing a lot of white people. Um, and uh, that was in the beginning towards the beginning of the um, the pandemic. And then in the middle of the pandemic, like Brittany says, I was seeing a lot of Latinos. It was a lot of like working class people, like a lot of construction workers, um, people who worked in restaurants. And um, I know like a lot of the comorbidities that we were seeing were people who were diabetic, people who had hypertension, people who were obese. Um, I can't say that all of those people <clears throat> so like some of the Latin people that I had, the majority of them were diabetic, but a lot of them were not obese. And they were a lot of men that I was seeing in their 50s, um, in their 40s. We did get, I mean, I mean, I would say that male and female were combined, but as far as like the ethnicity being Latin, it was a lot of Latin men that I was seeing getting it. Another thing that we were also seeing were a lot of um, Hasidic Jews. Really? Uh, yes. In my hospital specifically, there were a lot of Hasidics and they still, while in the hospital, were not comprehending like, you know, um, one of them we were going to send. So when the whole thing was like sending patients to um, nursing homes or whatever to get better, we were sending patients who were COVID positive to nursing homes. He's like, oh, I want to go to this nursing home because I want my family to come and see me. And I'm like, he had the news on. He's seeing all that's happening. There's no visiting, no nothing. And he's still talking about somebody coming to see him. And I'm like, dude, no one's coming to see you. Like, when you go home, you'll see your family. Like, you have to get better. I'm like, you're, you're watching the news. Like, what do you not understand, you know? So um, I think education is really important because that's, all, that's, that's why a lot of these people are sick and spreading it to others. What's that, um, what's that um, medication that um, the president was telling everybody to take? Hydroxychloroquine? What do you call it, Britt? <laughs> Hydroxychloroquine? I don't call it. I'd be like Plaquenil, because that's the brand name. I didn't even know that was the brand name. Plaquenil. I'd be like, here, take your Plaquenil. They're like, is, it the, is that the one with the H? I'm like, yup. I do represent the mind like IQs, intelligence, science, and all kinds of high